This is Rust in Production, a podcast about companies who use Rust to shape the future of infrastructure. My name is Matthias Endler from Corolla. Today we talk to Stephen Blum, CTO and founder of PopNop, about their experience with Rust, enhancing API performance and fostering a culture of innovation. Today we got Stephen with us. Stephen, can you introduce yourself and what do you do? Hi there, I'm Stephen, CTO at PubNub, and we work on building an edge net messaging network that we've invested a lot into. And we actually have a lot of, you know what I should have brought into us? The number of patents that we have that run against oh. this, because it's really easy to connect your servers to a message bus. You might be familiar with like Kafka or, or yeah. RabbitMQ or JMS. These are fantastic message buses. But once you hit the scale of, of the web where there's mobile devices and laptops that need to connect in, it's a different story. And that's uh, where we have some of PubNub's scale. We have over a billion devices connected to our network, which is not a small feat to be able to do that. And if you've ever pressed and you know, m dialed a call, you ever notice that it might take a little while for the other phone to ring? That's a signal. It's, it's actually a signal that's being delivered to the device to make that phone ring. And, and what we've done is we are able to provide a signal that happens the moment you click the button. We can make that signal deliver and we can do it at the scale of billions. And this is something that's been very challenging because it so all of a sudden thousands of devices, they might need to send and receive a lot of messages all at once. So we have this non-homogeneous workload and To be able to scale something like this has been a high challenge. And Rust is part of the picture. So I'm excited to talk about Rust in that. Amazing. That's why I wanted to talk to you because you, in your videos, you have this passion for what you do. And, and I guess you can transport it as well. And at the same time, PubNump seems to be a company with a lot of scale and something that you don't usually find And it's a pleasure to talk to you about maybe scalability things and also how latency is important to you because it feels like latency is also a big part of that equation. Is that correct? Yeah, it's huge, especially when we're, you know, we're in a prospect conversation. We've got customers that are evaluating us and speed tends to play a nice little bonus on top of it. Now, you might not always think that, hey, Some use cases don't necessarily need to be at light speed, though it is that much better when you have the experience to say, oh, I clicked the button. And, like, I didn't even see it. It already happened. Like, <laughs> it's like, and so you have to really pay. It's, it's a great experience. And so performance is a huge aspect that we So that's how we architected. We had to go a step further. So PubNub is not just, you know, like a server sitting in somewhere and devices connect into We're globally distributed. We run on AWS. We have Kubernetes clusters spread across all of Amazon's zones. And using GeoDNS, you connect to the closest region. And what that allows you to do is have a really good latency experience running on Amazon's network. You can, you can have users that are nearby have the best, like, you know, millisecond latency, sub millisecond latency. Like, it's, it's amazing the kind of performance that you can get. And then when users span across continents, you know, you're running on Amazon's network then at that point. So you still have a fantastic latency even across the world. What sort of background do you need to do all of that? Maybe we haven't really properly introduced yourself and, and your background, so maybe we can tie this in somehow. Yeah, it's, it, it's a good question. <laughs> it, you know, here, here's the deal. Like all the efforts that you jump into over the years and have these, these experiences... I think there's some level of value to that. I think really the biggest value that anyone can have is what, what's accomplishable today. Like, what are you able to achieve today? And really, it's all about putting your effort into it. So whether you have no experience or a little experience or a lot, it really comes down to what is going to happen today. Because you could have this huge amount of experience and then just sort of sit back and not do anything. <laughs> you could just relax. And then at that point, what's the point of the value? You've, you're bringing not much to the table and you need to be able to really dive in and bring value in. It's, it really doesn't matter about that level of experience. And so being able to build something like PubNub, 
required that level of diving. You really have to stand in, read the Linux documentation. Which kernel APIs do I need to worry about? What is How does the buffering work over here in the network layer? You need to just stack all that up and then you know, write it down and then build code that runs on, you know, Linux, what we have ePoll. We're running an ePoll. It's the primary speed performance boost that we have. And so can you explain what ePoll is and why it's important for PubNub? Yeah. So for PubNub with when you have millions of connections coming in, it's one server can't do it. However, the more connections you can have on a server, the better your margins and the higher scale you can offer and offer a better price to your customers. So in order to track those connections, you don't want a process that's actively looking at each of those connections on a box because that will burst your CPU. You'll immediately run out of CPU. What you need is an interrupt that the kernel provides through APIs, through different polling interfaces, which is exactly how all the devices on your your motherboard work when it's communicating to your devices it's all through interrupts in the kernel so you press a, a button like the it, different keyboard keyboard presses on your keyboard those are interrupts that come through but there's nothing that's actively checking did you press the h key did you press the j key it only goes through interrupts and that allows you to have an efficient communication through the hardware on the system and so this is what epol is It is an interface that allows us to receive those interrupts through the OS, bind them onto network events, and then be able to act on them or emit data over, over, over the bus and get all sorts of scale. It's, it's night and day. If we didn't have this, it would be a lot more expensive to run PubNub. From, from what you tell me, it sounds like you've always been interested in performance, interested in these technical problems and, and how to solve them. If, did us, if that is correct, when did you first get in touch with Rust and how did it feel like? And also, what did you do before Rust? So today, PubNub's written in C, mm -hmm. which has been, you know, there's, there are challenges with that, right? We've got all sorts of stability over the years that we've nailed down and we've got fantastic performance Rust came into the picture when one of our senior engineers like, hey, check this thing out over here. There's this thing called Rust. And this was maybe, oh, I don't know, five years plus, long time ago. And we we're all like, yeah, yeah, that's just Rust. Sure. <laughs> What is this thing? No one really knew. But it turns out the capabilities of Rust with the memory safety and the performance that we get near C speeds uh, is really attractive to us. That level of capability is huge, it's especially with the compiler being able to detect some common problems. That level of attractiveness at our scale brings in the reason why we brought Rust in, basically. Okay. And before we talk about Rust, I'm curious about the C code as well, because when you run such a platform, you're bound to run into runtime problems as well. And you probably had your fair share mm -hmm. of maybe outages or maybe runtime issues. Maybe can you tell us a few stories that you encountered through all these years with your Rust and with your C experience? Yeah, absolutely. So you run into these things called segmentation faults <laughs> all the time. And you get these things that are called core, core dump files, which is all the memory that the current application at the time had and then that saves that to disk so you can go in and debug it but you don't want to be in that scenario because that means that you've you know you potentially damaged or or data can be lost like there's problems in that scenario and, and, and how does it work then did you have an on-call rotation did you have a lot of outages or a lot of incidents and how has that changed since then yeah <laughs> a lot of problems over the years Yeah, absolutely. We hit in scale, running into m memory pressure, hitting. Uh, so with PubNub, you can multiplex data on a single connection, mm -hmm. which means that you need to subscribe to certain topics or channels. We call them channels in PubNub. You can also apply filters to those channels and say, I only want to receive messages that have this tag or that are beyond this threshold based on this floating point value. So you can make those subscriptions. 
the problem comes in, how do you manage the memory when you're streaming this data over through a network across systems in a distributed fashion and then multiplex that data in, but then still you have to deal with memory management and cleanup afterwards. And so it's really easy to free some data or free a pointer or something, <laughs> but you really needed to keep that alive for a little while. And Did so you have the opposite was... problem too, where you were leaking data over a longer period of time? Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> we had that problem too. We absolutely had that problem. And we were using memory allocators that were performing like JMalloc. Mm -hmm. Even in that case, we were in situations where memory just kept growing. And it's, it's a tough situation because you run things like Valgrind and you like dive in and you want to find where those leaks are because, you know, it's causing slow, it's, it's, it's expensive. You don't want that because it's memory is not cheap. And so in order to stay up and operating, you have to buy more memory to outpace the growth, that leak. Uh, mm -hmm. And then that buys you time to find the problem. So, so on one side, you have a very performant language like C, which saves you hardware costs, I guess, because it's it's really efficient. And on the other side, you have engineering costs because of these issues. And I wonder how you balance it out, if it evened out at the end, or if you noticed that the engineering costs were significantly higher than, say, the hardware savings. And mm -hmm. what's your take on this? if you run such a platform at scale? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, it's, it's, I, because we've been doing this for 14 years, we've, we have time and experience under our belt. And so we've been able to create a stable system over the years that right. is the most powerful, most popular, have most heavily used API in our current suite of APIs. How did you hire for such positions? Did you go to hardcore network admins? Did you go to fang companies that had staff engineers with that experience? How did you find such people even? Yeah, it's all the recruiting patterns that we possibly could take advantage of because finding C experts today, even back uh, even back 10 years ago, was a challenge because uh, even if you were a C expert, it, you don't really might want not want right C anymore <laughs> because you know all the challenges and problems that come with it. And especially in a system like the web where you need to have something that's active and always alive, resilient, and it's, you know, we can rely on it. That's a scary proposition. It's like, okay, so we're going to have to write some C that's like super stable and any bit of latency is going to be noticed. So it's like the worst possible situation. <laughs> Did you ever have that situation where someone came into a job interview applying for a role as a C developer and actively saying by themselves that they don't want to use the language anymore for such problems and that they wanted to try something else? Or was it more like they learned on the job that C at scale was hard? They probably knew about that before. So it was, Yeah, they knew ahead of time. Yeah, <laughs> they had the experience because it's really, I think even if you're getting started as a C developer, you'll immediately run into the segmentation fault or something else. Like it is, a, it's a rite of passage, something that will happen. It's like guaranteed. Yeah. The question is not if, but when. Mm -hmm. That's correct. The other thing I wondered about was, Kafka is written in Java, and then there's this new competitor, I guess it's called Nuts, which is written in Go. And did you ever consider to use any of these languages? Java wasn't on the list, mostly because that was mostly an academic language, at least for me at the time, right? And mm -hmm. that was, it seemed not like the right language if I wanted to get the best possible speed and performance for mm -hmm. exactly what I was looking for. So I wanted something that was, you know, robust and powerful. And Go? What about Go? You know, Go wasn't, I didn't know about Go back then. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> that wasn't, that didn't even make the list because I didn't know what it was. I guess by now, you know, Go and maybe you have a couple of thoughts about it, especially comparing it with Rust, for example. What's your take on this? I like the compiling speed of Go 
<laughs> a lot better. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, it's it's boom. It's immediate. It's almost immediate compared to uh, to like Rust, for example. So, yeah. it. But otherwise, we still we so we have a service in production with Go. We actually have a couple services in production with Go. But you still run into runtime errors with Go. Mm-hmm. Like that was something that's like, oh, it's a compiled language and it's more modern. You know, it's a little bit Pythonic and you know the the syntax is a little more streamlined. But there's it's still easy to get verbose with the language. It's easy to over abstract, and it still runs into runtime errors. The performance is okay in production, but it has these GC pauses that we noticed. We did attempt to rewrite part of our pub sub bus and go. And it couldn't even come close, not even close okay. in performance. Did you have a one-to-one comparison? Did you run a benchmark? And mm. how did that look like? Yeah, latency was immediately 10x slower just out the gate, even at low scale. And latency was, you know, it's, it kind of tails up into, you know, how, how much further we can push the thing. Um, messages per second were, like, was it 5x less, right? It's yeah, and then there were the GC pauses. So just suddenly, like, latency would spike periodically, mm-hmm. and that was not great either, right? So we've got this thing that's over here. We want to re, and we actually the question you would ask is like, why would we choose to attempt to rewrite something that we have that's robust and C and it's stable? Rewrite it in Go, yeah. and the answer is maintainability because we're scared to touch it. It's working right now, mm-hmm. and if we make any adjustments, you know, that's the danger zone. And, and so, how did you go about like even or how would you go about rewriting parts of that in Rust if that is even an option for you? Because certainly for companies, it is just a cost to rewrite anything. And it's also a risk. You need training, you need adoption, you need trust in what you build and what you deploy. Does it even make sense for you right now? And if so, how would you address such a topic yeah it's it's is as we go so right now rust is the most popular language at pubnub by far all of our new services are typically elected to be written in rust Hmm. everything going forward will be rust and this is due to our scale and you know we've seen fantastic results from it we actually i actually have some real world numbers as we have replaced some of our services with rust Uh, and it has been fantastic. Can you share some of these numbers? I would love to hear them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so some of our services were written in Python. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> has some performance considerations uh, in general with Python. We have gotten past some of those using something called PyPy, mm-hmm. which is, you know, what is it? More about memory route routing and pathing, but at runtime. And so yeah, like a tr- it, just-in-time compiler for Python. Exactly, mm-hmm. yeah. And there's a trade-off, though, because it takes up a lot more memory. Okay. Like, a lot. Like, it can go gigabytes per process. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the CPU is, you know, five times faster, which is... And CPUs are expensive, right? You, you pay around four pennies per hour for CPU on Amazon per CPU. And then memory is, what well, it's like half that price, right, based on... So it's like a good trade-off in terms of cost. When when we replaced that service with Rust, we saw another 5x boost, not only in memory, but in performance as well on top of it. That means you use one-fifth of the memory in Rust compared to PyPy. Well, actually, way, way less. <laughs> it's more like 30, 30 megabytes or something like that in Rust versus a gigabyte. In PyPy, because oh, wow. PyPy is it likes the memory. It keeps it's a memory fan. Would you would you say over provisioning is fine for some of your problems? Where let's say you have a big event and you know exactly that this is upcoming, and then you need to prepare the infrastructure for it. Do you usually over provision for such a case? And in this case, you scale it up to whatever memory it needs times two, for example? Or would you say, no, this is exactly what ruins our uh, costs and and I guess we want to be as close to what we need as possible? Where do you draw the line? Oh, it's a business question. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, that's a good one. Because, you know, we want to make sure that we're we're making profit 
we want to keep pushing forward, continue innovating. And that's where our source of funds allows us to do that. And if we're spending all of our, if we get like, here, Amazon, take all the money, <laughs> we'll just give all of it over to Amazon, then we won't have any to continue to grow the business. So yeah, that's, that is, that is a trade-off, right? There's a balance. How far do you go? Something that we took heavily into investment was Kubernetes and auto scaling with HPAs. So these days now, PubNub, we don't have to do any extra beforehand readiness. The what is system, HPA? Horizontal pod auto scaling. And how does it help you in this case? It auto scales for us. Okay. Based <laughs> so on we, memory usage or CPU usage, or do you have any yep, custom? It could be both and custom metrics too. Mm -hmm. So based on network load, based on connectivity, number of connections, based on the CPU usage, we can target our, our scale, tar our, our desired amount of resources that we purchase. Mm -hmm. And this is really cool. And now the way we spend, like you're talking about our budgeting, how much do we pre-purchase? We don't need to do that ahead of time, say if there's a big event. What we do is we just think, okay, how much, it's a throttle, it's a YAML config file for us. We use Helm for Helm charts. Mm -hmm. We just say, okay, let's bring it up to 50% or bring it down to 20%. Like it depends on this, on which service we're, we're optimizing. And then that allows the system like, okay, when it hits this threshold across the pool of pods as an average, I will add more. Or if it dips below, then I will subtract some. So that way it's always at this particular level. And so now we don't have to pre-scale. We just tune with levers. So you got predictable performance, especially for the new services, which going forward will be written in Rust. Yeah. And and coming back to the original question, how would you integrate a new service into your current infrastructure? Say you have a Rust service and then you have all of the previous services that you have. Do you connect with them on the network layer? Do you integrate them with FFI, like the foreign function interface and start yeah. to yeah, compile things and maybe use language bindings or, or what's your take on this? Do you do it through maybe your own channel and you send messages and you do some sort of event sourcing? Like, is it a hybrid of these models? How does it look like in the back end? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a, a strong question. Depends on the, the situation, right? So there's two kinds of typical models that you see in the industry and we leverage both. One model is you know, a request and response based through an API. Mm -hmm. That's our primary like offering. And so if we were using, when we're using Rust, for example, we use Axiom mm -hmm. uh, as a API pr framework. Mm -hmm. And then for our, our event driven, which is the other approach, right? So you've got these other ones. We've got web and event. For event, we run off of MSK through Kafka with, which is like Amazon's competitor to Confluent. Um, okay. And we run off of that as an event source. And that allows us to process that data asynchronously out of band from the system, right? So you've got these inline API calls, and then you've got these asynchronous background workers that work in the event sourcing. And how do the workers communicate internally? Do you use JSON or Protobuf or Captain Proto or something else? Yeah, it's Protobuf for some, for some others, it's JSON. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, but it's, yeah. I would assume that you use Protobuf for some of the more, let's say, high traffic topics, or maybe the ones that need the most stability. That's also an important factor, right? Back at my previous job, we used JSON and then moved to Protobuf. And what we found was that the number of errors would go down because you would handle all of the edge cases more or less at compile time because you knew the binary format and there were way less surprises at runtime. Did you see the same? What's your take on Protobuf? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, usually the project that we had, we didn't migrate like you did, so I don't have a comparison between the two. Mm -hmm. um, I can, we can see both sides and they're both doing what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Protobuf is more, more performant. With us, we, PubNub, our primary API is JSON-based for our customers as you're connecting to devices and sending data between them. Right. So even if you're connected up through an IOT device, like August lock is one of our customers. You can send a message from your phone to trigger your 
door to open to unlock. Hmm. That nice. is, yeah, that that's JSON, right? You can choose to also make it a string or base64 encode it to have maybe more, you know, shorten that down. But for us, since everything's in JSON and it's a lot of it's text, all, most of it's text, Protobuf doesn't change much of that because it's all text-based. But things like maybe a Boolean where it would be the best, right? Because you've got these strings like T-R-U-E or F-L-A-S-E, right? Those are big character strings that can be, Protobuf can really shrink those down. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, you probably have compression enabled anyway. So you use it, you use GZIP. And then since in big payloads, you have some repetition, you probably benefit from this as well. So it's not like... I can see a lot of advantages on both sides. It's very true. Speaking of advantages and coming back to Rust for a little bit, I wonder if you could pick only one trait of Rust, whether it might be performance or stability slash robustness. So on one side, you have raw performance. On the other side, you have operational robustness. What would you pick? It could only be one of these. I'm leaning towards performance. Mm -hmm. I think performance, I mean, yeah, because obviously we chose C at, at the Alco, right? And then most of the internet still runs on C today. That yeah. Because of the scale that we're at, performance is paramount. Yeah. And, and then the first endeavor you had with Rust, what was it? What was the first project you tried at PopNup and, and you... Yeah, obviously I thought it was a success because you moved forward with it. Was it like a typical CLI app or was it a service that you started or how did it work? Yeah, good question. First, Rust at PubNub was talking about gRPC. We were offering and looking to offer a gRPC endpoint that you can communicate with devices outside the network on like things on cell towers and things like that. We added that we built grpc.pubnum.com with rust nice. you can connect in yeah and, and and that was pretty early in in this grpc world for rust because the ecosystem probably back in the day wasn't as mature as it is now if you want to call it that and grpc just for the people that don't know it's I guess, remote procedure calls, and it comes from Google. I think this is what the G stands for. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But it's basically protobuf over HTTPS and HTTP2, I guess. Is that correct? Yep. And you provided that service. And, and why did you pick Rust for this specific task to begin with? That was the engineer I was talking about earlier. The senior engineer was like, hey, did you hear about this thing called Rust? And then two years later, after this, like, okay, let's build the service in Rust. Let's just do it. Let's see how it goes. And we did it and it worked. Were there any setbacks or was there any pushback from the team to maybe move away from an existed tried and tested technology and moving towards Rust? Were they skeptical? Was there any resistance, so to say? There was a surprising amount of excitement. I would say, oh. yeah, and and just eagerness to move forward with the next generation technology, which super endearing. Like, and, and did that. you set any goals or expectations before the project? For example, do you say, oh yeah, all the tests need to pass, or it needs to be integrated with our CI/CD pipeline, or did you say, well, it's such a new technology anyway, you cannot really set those standards because you need to try and experiment. And if you set two stringent goals, then what you end up with is maybe the same solution that you had before. So let's just see what it takes and run free. Yeah, that's that's a lot more of my philosophy is the latter there is like, hey, let's let's see how far we can push this. Let's see where we can go. Let's be pioneers here as well. And, you know, It turns out Rust, I think, and I believe is is that next, it is the you know multi-billion dollar language that if you take advantage of it, you're, you will profit from it. Like, that is, it's no doubt in my mind, we're already seeing it now. It's, it's fantastic. Would you say that is true for things outside of infrastructure or for infrastructure specifically? Oh, okay. 
So, all right, let's think about like devices in the world that might be running Rust, right? Mm-hmm. Like maybe your car or maybe some there. I mean, we need to consider binary sizes and other kinds of hardware limitation that comes into the picture. And obviously we're in, you know, almost 2024 now and we've got supercomputers of all sorts of shapes and sizes and everything's really fast and small. We're in the future, though it's still like, we might as well take the best advantage that we can. And, you know, I haven't tried, how small can we get rust? Does it, can it go pretty small? I've seen usually pretty big binaries that, kind of look like it, they're scary, a little scary to have on like IoT devices. Mm-hmm. And would there be a use case for PopNup to deploy to IoT devices? Is it something that you do oh, or have on your no. roadmap? <laughs> no, no, I'm just thinking like how far can we stretch the rust? Like how far can it go? Now, obviously we can, it can basically run everywhere. I would say mm-hmm. any device uh, and it can be fine. And, you know, maybe we can optimize its footprint over time. But for PubNub and our API service, being a communications company where we need to have that reliability and the speed and performance, no doubt Rust is our top choice going forward. Maybe let's turn it around and say, do some of your customers use it for IoT devices already? They do. Yeah. Actually, now that you mention it, we do have a customer and they've been they've actually been pushing us for years for a rust sdk because they have their devices in iot device that's deployed with rust you know i didn't even think of that and they chose rust because it's got that stability reliability and yeah we we did we delivered them a rust sdk so it can communicate because they had to do it by hand before and now with the rust sdk it's even and even cooler with rust it, you can integrate that into existing C applications, mm-hmm. right? So you, you, you were mentioning FFI and things like that. So this is a neat strategy that we're looking into to make sure that our existing customers that are C-based, which we have several that are still in C, they could actually just rely more heavily on our Rust SDK that we spend more time on, right? Because that, I like that. Now we can start putting, where else can we put Rust? How far can it go? <laughs> Let's bring it everywhere. True. It seems like since this is open source, and yeah, I, I take this way because I read the blog post about it, but it is open source. And the beauty of it is that people could look at it and integrate it into their projects. And it could be some sort of standard or protocol that you use to communicate with PopNub. And I guess developing such standards in the open is is a huge advantage as well for you from a company perspective. Yeah. And we talked a lot about the upsides of Rust. Of course, there are still downsides. There are things that are just trade-offs we need to be aware of. And Compile a couple time. things that I can think of, for example, might be if you're too much on the bleeding edge, then you might at least risk instabilities or you might risk some churn from time to time because not every introduction of a new technology runs very smoothly. But I wonder what what your take is on this. Is that really a huge problem in Rust's case? Did you have other transitions which were easier or harder? And also, would you even say that there are downsides or what would be the downsides of Rust? That's a, That's good a lot question. of questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm really thinking about this. You know, I was reading your reading your Why Rust article, and the part that st- stood out to me was how npm migrated to Rust. Yeah. What? I mean, their whole thing is JavaScript. Like, why? <laughs> that was so great when I read them. Is that as they really did that? That's been. <laughs> they did that in 2019. And one thing that I was extremely surprised by was they do 1.3 billion JavaScript package downloads per day. Wow. Which is incredible. Yeah. That's amazing. And okay, Rust makes, yeah, Rust to the win (laughs) for sure. Yeah. Yeah, That's another win for Rust. And what are the losses? What are the downsides? Yeah. Are there any downsides? I mean, it, the compiler does take a while, but you know, when you're doing iterative compilations, when you're locally developing, it's fine. 
it's like a couple of seconds here or there. So that that's that no worries on that. From a stability perspective, the compiler itself, even if you're bringing in like alpha software or alpha packages, like with a 0.0.1 like mm-hmm. version number, it's the compiler is still doing a good job there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it's very likely that as long as you're just you know, leaning on the Rust native primitives for concurrency, then these, th- I think that it's, it's Wild West at that point. You don't really have to worry about it because you're going to have that compiler safety. So I, I think that's also okay, right? I mean, tell me I'm wrong. Like, I think that's... I fully agree, 100%. What about the ecosystem? Did you miss any packages, anything that's like could be better from an ecosystem perspective? You mentioned pre-1.0 packages. Is that a huge problem for you? Or would you say, no, actually, you're pretty much covered? Getting RD Kafka, libRD Kafka, I would say that one's usually a pain to get to work. Uh, every yeah. time a developer tries to set up a dev environment or get it to compl- deploy into production or in- integration, they have trouble. I do. Mm-hmm. I have trouble too. It's like, oh, great, libRD Kafka. Okay. So there, there are rough edges into getting things to work. But as soon as you get all the right settings tweaked and dependencies ready, it does exactly what it needs to do. I can see why librdkafka might be a problem. I like it, but as far as I can remember, it has bindings to other C libraries like OpenSSL, and yep. this makes it extremely hard sometimes to pin the correct version mm-hmm. in librdkafka, which we will pre- use from the Rust side at some point, and then you need to kind of transitively talk to the C compiler to do the right thing and to link against the correct libraries yeah it can be a bit of a pain i guess yeah Yeah. so there's there's those challenges oh okay i got i got another good one for you i'm i'm a proponent of simplicity and very keeping things as simple as possible and even you know as we're writing code abstractions typically though they sound nice and fancy Mm -hmm. they are they add this debt over time and i would say it's better to do have repeated code and not have super abstractions. But Rust comes with all sorts of fancy bells and whistles, doesn't it? What are these generics and traits and all these fun things? And it's really easy to be attracted to those because they look appealing. um, And they do bring some benefits. They add a huge amount of overhead for bringing new people into the team. And as we're training on the job, that level of complexity just adds a huge barrier to entry. And Rust is massive for that that's probably the biggest downside can i have like an easy rust i want like a simple rust that's what i want well there is one guy david mcloyd i'm not sure if i pronounced the name correctly but he recently wrote a book about simple rust and i guess the idea was to to go and maybe learn rust up to a point where it's usable for solving your problem, but not go too far. And certainly I agree that there is an issue with too many abstractions and it feels like Rust attracts people that like abstractions. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And then they, at least their second Rust program is barely readable and, you know, they add traits and then they add so many abstractions until they come back to the essentials and, and work on the core of the idea again. Yeah, um, that's, that's much better. Just keeping things simple, it's maintainable. Anyone can come in and read it. There's not this giant barrier to entry. That- did, did you notice that from your perspective, is async Rust another such dialect which makes the language harder to understand? Did you get in touch with async Rust and what's your opinion on that? A bit, you know, I would say async helps because having to deal with futures was mm-hmm. always very annoying. And I remember early days, even even now, when I was running the compiler and anything to do with the future, the compiler, it always tries to be helpful. But if it had a future involved, it would just pr- print out n- n- pages of unintelligible. Like there's no way to debug it, like even close. Have they fixed that? I don't know. Is that better with futures now? Because I haven't, I haven't run into it myself personally recently. 
Yeah, it is gotten it has gotten much better, of course. You don't have to write futures yourself anymore. I'm not sure if you ever did that, but it's not fun. Yeah. Now the language helps you a lot more and the error messages are still not ideal, but they get better. <laughs> yeah. I love it. They're like, hey, there's this thing, do this right here, and that'll fix your problem. I'm like, okay. And I'll go in and type it in and do it. In, and it is it's like error no you did it wrong you did it totally wrong and it's like the compiler's yelling at me but i just did what you told me to do why isn't it working and so that still happens today with with myself i still run into that problem how do you teach people on rust how do you train them and how do you spread knowledge across your company Yeah, good question. So it's all on the job training. We also have community practices where we jump in and say, hey, learn these cool things about Rust. And we try we try to keep that going. We also have a dedicated Slack channel where mm -hmm. we, we post all sorts of things. We even posted links to one of your articles. One of our engineers jumped in there. It's like, hey, look, there's this article over here. Check it out. And it ended up being Matthias's article. I'm like, whoa, check it out. <laughs> Thank so cool. you for that. Yeah. So it's it's a lot of knowledge sharing. Uh, and that sort of thing. Was that always the case? Did this first engineer that wrote the first Rust service also share their experiences with the team? And was it something that kind of came naturally and they talked about it? Or was it enforced by the organization to keep spreading knowledge? It was encouraged, mostly informal. So it, was, it started informal and organically. And then more heavily encouraged, you know, mostly I'm a big champion. So I, I wanted to push that as much as possible and encourage rust where it all possible because it's, there's, there's profit there. There's gold. Rust is like this nice, uh, from a business perspective, you would ch only choose rust for everything, basically uh -huh. all scenarios, including yeah. AI, <laughs> but it's all yep. Python these days, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and do you see a future where AI and Rust come together and and maybe the infrastructure or the platform that AI runs on is written in Rust? There's a very... Ch so today it's written mostly in C, right? So even if you're running Python, you're probably using LibTorch, which is Facebook's framework that mm -hmm. is written in C. And it communicates the GPU and uh, most of the latency is in the round trip between the, the system bus and the memory that you have for those matrices, having to pipe that over to the GPU to run some multiplications. And so that latency is the main bottleneck these days. And through various pipelining techniques and texture memory buffers, you can provide some major improvements there. Even with Python, which is the main language these days you're still mostly using C libraries at that point, right? And so my thought is, how much faster can we make it if we do this in Rust? Can we bring it even further? And there are some wins there because as you're doing data processing, data cleaning, and all sorts of other things that need to go through the pipeline, those are non-GPU tasks for mm -hmm. the most part. And so if we start getting more Rust into the ecosystem, do data, data cleaning, data processing, embeddings, right? Those things are non-GPU tasks, they're CPU tasks, because we need to convert various organic data, which is going to be like text or images or, you know, pixels. We need to convert that over into embedding format, which is, you know, dense matrixy that we can then pipe over to a GPU. Yeah. And this is where Rust can start shining beyond the existing pipelines with Python. Because it would reduce the memory that is required for these transformations or for some other reason? Memory, performance, more more organic performance there. And, you know, we do see, was it NumPy and some other Python libraries are also C-based. Mm -hmm. So you're still getting some C-based performance there. But there's still the overhead of the communication between, you know, the Python VM and the, the C library dependencies. So... I think there's just a better chance to go more native Rust in terms of performance, especially as we're starting to get bigger, right? So NVIDIA just announced their H2s, which are almost double the amount of gigabytes, like 141 gigabytes for GPU. <laughs> it's like a huge amount of memory. And that just means a lot of data. And 
the more we can save in performance, Rust, I think, can take us that much closer. Time to order one. I know very little about machine learning, to be honest. But one thing I heard about is that in the data science area, there are a lot of improvements being made by people that use Rust for the first time for some of the lower level libraries. I might be wrong here, but I guess Parquet is written in Rust now or parts of it. And Parquet is this data format which is, I guess, column and row based. And it's kind of efficient if you want to do very typical data science transformations. You see, my knowledge is pretty limited here, but it feels like Rust is getting into these areas as well. That's a good way to get Rust into things is make it as a library that you can import and into other languages. So it becomes a foundational technology that you cannot escape from anymore. I like that. It's like, you're getting rust whether you like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> It's all rust in the end. Would you say there's still room for improvement for tooling in general? I'm talking about debuggers or profilers and things that might help you in your day-to-day. -day? Yeah, I think the, the biggest one would be, so you can set up a linter, you can set up your linting configuration to have certain standards and be more strict about certain things, right? right? Like guarantee no ability to use the word unsafe anywhere ever, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yes. That, that, that's a really good one. Make sure we have that. Uh, but also I want a linter that more strictly enforces like maybe a Lego version of Rust, a simple, like a Python version where it's just really super duper simple. And I think You know, that's something that might already be available to us today. I just hadn't really jumped in to investigate it much. But I think something like that, where we just have like easy, simple Rust, and the linter will check that to make sure, hey, you're using something that's a little too complex. Go this direction instead, using something more simple. Even if there's a little bit of repetition, I think it's, it, it's a lot more worthwhile. This is a brilliant idea. I never thought about that, but it makes total sense the tool would simplify your code. It would be like a refactoring tool, which instead of making code more abstract, it will make it more readable, more maintainable, and more testable, and maybe give you advice. I wonder how such a tool could look like, but actually these are things that I personally believe that AI might help us with to see those patterns and say, oh yeah, maybe this has higher complexity actually maybe you don't even need ai for this because you could just look at complexity numbers themselves there are cyclic complex complexity numbers and all that stuff and this has been researched and has been going on for decades now i guess we don't really use that knowledge which is out there to put it into practice and maybe simplify our code i can totally see where you're coming from and is that something that you would Where would you even look for such a tool? Where would you even go and maybe ask for such a tool? And how do you find find out about these new developments in general around Rust or just about new technologies? What are your resources? Yeah, yeah, it's it's tough, right? So we go to the you know the the R Rust for Reddit, and there's other places we can go to jump around. Maybe even ask on on various channels. Probably Reddit would be a way to go and. You know, adding these things to CICD as a gating requirement is is that I think it's it's a good way to get that going. So we do have linting and like it, it must be Rust has to have passed the formatter check. So you can have because you can do a lot of interesting, fun things with Rust and put things all over the place. But you know, we want Rust FMT as a you know a basic readability. So that's that's in there. But if we could add one more thing to simplify Rust and not have these advanced language features that are really fancy that, you know, at the end of the day, it's an over-optimization because how often do we really go back to that code, um, mm -hmm. especially since it's Rust? We don't need to go back and modify it that often at, at the rate that it justifies us mm -hmm. creating such a complex, fun, fancy feature addition. So it's, I it's a really cool idea, for sure. Yeah, Probably it's something between Go and Rust 
and mm -hmm. erring more towards the rust end with ownership and borrowing and no runtime but very simple abstractions i like it yeah i wonder what you could throw out from rust core to even keep the rust spirit if you know what i mean maybe there are a couple things that might not be needed and i also wondered about your approach towards using the right paradigm for the job because what you build is also essentially very purely functional in nature if you like to build it this way right you could model something in a very functional pipeline where you take input you transform it and then you send it somewhere else or to multiple places without any side effects but at the same time you have object-oriented programming in rust as well which some people use for the same problem and it's also totally fine to do so but i wonder where you find the balance where do you draw the line here yeah that's that's a really good question and i think we just have to You know, Rust comes with, you can, you can do modules and keep things, you know, in files and then access those functions from those files using, you know, Rust scope. I think that could be the line to draw from there. And then as we're importing or leveraging those functions, mm -hmm. um, we don't need to go any much further in terms of abstraction beyond mm -hmm. that. That means you use object-oriented programming on a larger scale to structure the code and inside of functions, you could use functional paradigms like map and filter and yeah. collect, for example. Okay, I see. That makes a lot of sense. This is also how I think about it. Well, I guess we're getting closer towards the end. And I have two questions. One that I kind of forgot to, to ask and one that is a sort of tradition around here. The first question I forgot to ask is about onboarding. Let's say you need to find a Rust engineer or someone that maintains a larger part of your stack that is written in Rust. Would you say you're looking for someone that already has Rust experience and maybe is proficient with the Rust paradigms such that they can go in and hit the ground running and know the principles and maybe also avoid what we talked about before where they maybe add too many abstractions and they have some production experience or would you say you would rather hire someone that comes from a different language and is smart and can get things done and you train them on the job yeah it's both both is the answer the pool of rust engineers is also one of the downsides with rust today having that rust expertise is not as commonplace as say like javascript for example right yeah. most popular language And so we need to expand that pool by allowing, you know, folks who are interested in writing in Rust as their day job, uh, who might, you know, be excited to learn about it, even on the job. And if they wanted to pursue a career at PopNob or they wanted to learn more about PopNob, could you give the listeners some hints, some resources that they can go and check out, any videos, any any tutorials or maybe also free tiers that they can check out. Ooh, yeah. So I, the first thing to do definitely is to go to pubnum.com and click sign up so you can see firsthand that we are a communications company and edge messaging technology that allows devices to communicate. And we're in the top 10 apps in the app store for communication, including something hot that needs extreme latency, such as games, right? Games need to have that really, when you're doing multiplayer, Latency is really critical because you're gonna you're gonna have you're there to have fun and any blips or or, or dots in the that experience they take away from that that fun right and we're, and we're here to have fun and so that level of performance and capability and scale is something that we offer and you can get that firsthand experience by signing up and giving it a tryout. Right. And as far as I remember, you are also pretty active on LinkedIn. You post regular videos and they are very entertaining. You explain various concepts. And I think this would be one other resource that I could recommend. I personally follow that. And as I said, lastly, it has become a tradition around here to ask this final question, which is, do you have a message to the broader Rust community? Something that you want to share, an opinion, maybe a message 
for the future of Rust. You already touched on many, many different points that you could tie into, but I just want to give you the microphone and you can say whatever you want to the Rust community now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so this is a, this is an easy one. So we we chatted a little bit about this earlier. Let's have the Lego version of Rust, please. I want a really simple version of Rust and just have it baked in. For example, maybe some sort of switch, and it should be a standard, or for it needs to be sort of implied that hey, this is the accepted approach for simple Rust. If we had something like that, and the community was on board. I think it would be a lot easier to get the adoption of Rust. Why is Python, why is JavaScript so popular? Because the entry point is so much easier. With Rust, it is a major challenge, and it is very difficult to really dive in, especially having to deal with some of the more heavily abstracted scenarios. If we could have simple mode, like easy mode, that will just go even further in terms of the adoptions within organizations. I think that will be a huge bonus, but also make me a lot happier too, because now we have this really simple Rust that allows our developers to jump in more easily and we can other teams can deal with it. So I think that will help us make Rust more portable. I love it. It's a really great idea. And if it's not a compiler feature, it could still be some sort of course or training material to maybe have a... 0.5 step or like 50% of the way. And yes, it has been a pleasure to talk to you, Stephen. I wish you all the best with PopNup. I see a lot of promising alleys for your future and for using Rust in production. And I really like the energy as well. This is something also I wanted to share. It's always a pleasure to talk to you because, as I said, you're an entrepreneur and engineer at heart, and it's a very nice combination you have going there and i guess it just shows so thanks a lot yeah it was a great great talking with you today uh thank you so much for the time and we'll we'll chat again amazing see you see you